Tommy knew that he wasn't supposed to do that. Him and I talked about it before the accident in uh, a couple different occasions. He said, you know, mom, he's got us going into the silo. Um, he knew it wasn't right, but yet he continued to do it because that was what his job was. It was May 2011, and Tommy Osier had just turned 18. He had been working on the farm of a family friend for just one month. He loved working with the dairy cattle, but dreaded having to fix their feed. The augers, which pushed feed corn out of the silo, were broken, so Tommy had to go into the dank cement bin and bust up the clumps of moist corn caked to the sides. Tommy's friend, Gary Heiser, works on a farm nearby. He remembers that Tommy was happy to have the job. Around here, it, uh, farming is pretty much everything. The only thing else besides around here is the casino. Tommy was an outgoing kid who loved to fish and hunt, but he had been held back in school and was struggling to graduate. He used to get in trouble all the time, so, so did I. <laughs> but uh, just work and just matured us both. Just, instead of getting in trouble, we'd go out and do something productive. On the day Tommy died, volunteer firefighters Matt Schwab and Roger Sangsland responded to the 911 call saying that a teen was trapped in a silo. When we arrived, the employee that Tommy was working with told us that Tommy was in the bottom of the silo with approximately 20 feet of corn on top of him. And at that point then, we knew the severity of the situation. It took 35 emergency workers four hours to remove Tommy Osier's body from the silo. I held him. I got to hold him out, out of the silo. And um, they cleared the calf barn for us to, for privacy. And they put him on a truck in uh, the back of a truck and put us in there. Can I ask that they sure. clear the corn from no. his nose and his mouth? No. It was still like that. Oh. Yeah. What broke my heart the most was to see it had completely dislodged his jaw. You know, to see his form, you know, his physical form and his jaw was completely dislodged. And the corn had impacted and packed it so much it was in his lungs. The corn was in his lungs. All right, more family into the ring, 79.9, and then there was two. Got two in warning. Stories like Tommy's are increasingly common in farming communities. One of the things we're trying to teach here is how much difficulty there is to trying to pull somebody out of grain. And if you're partially buried in grain, it takes several hundred pounds of pull. Bill Field is an agricultural health and safety expert at Purdue University. Okay, how many of you have grain bins at home? So two of you have grain bins. How many of you have been in a grain bin? while you're at home, while you're cleaning it out. And he and his colleagues have come to the Indiana State Fair to preach silo safety. Of course, by the time they got back and knocked the, the door off the bottom and got the grain out here, he had done suffocating. Right. Yep, he's already been in there. So. Over the last 35 years, Dr. Field has collected the most comprehensive data on grain engulfments and entrapments in the United States. Bridging can occur when grain quality deteriorates. This video, by the Safety and Technical Rescue Association, illustrates two common entrapment scenarios. Rescuers think something like this happened to Tommy Osier. While farm accidents on the whole are decreasing, accidents in silos and grain bins are rising, in step with demand for grain for food, feed, and increasingly, ethanol. We're handling more grain than we've ever handled in history in this country. And the amount of storage and the size of the storage and the capacity of, as far as handling the grain has increased so rapidly that we've just exposed an awful lot more people to the potential for engulfment. Tommy Osier was 18 when he died in the silo, but a disproportionate number of engulfment casualties are teenage boys under the age of 15. The youngest or newest workers are often called upon to walk the corn to loosen it, a hazardous job experts say no one should do. We had, for several years, had, had suggested that there need to be attention given to the child labor laws affecting agriculture because they were out of date. And they did not address some of the new hazards that were being introduced into agriculture. 
Federal child labor laws have not been updated since the 1960s. In August of 2011, after several particularly gruesome green bin accidents involving teens, the U.S. Labor Department moved to protect the youngest farm workers. The proposed change would have, among other things, made it illegal for agricultural workers under the age of 16 to operate power equipment, like tractors, milkers, and grain augers. The Department of Labor has proposed new labor regulations that many farmers and ranchers fear would make it illegal for young teens to do traditional, routine farm chores. Even though children working on their family farms would have been exempted from the rule, the agricultural lobby, led by the Farm Bureau, called it an attack on the rural way of life. The Farm Bureau went to war. That's the simplest way to describe it. Uh, the Bureau in Washington and its state affiliates launched an intemperate, uh, distorted misinformation campaign about what this rule was really trying to do. The Department of Labor received over 10,000 letters responding to the proposal. The message had already gotten out there that uh, this may threaten the parental rights of, uh, of farm families as to how they can assign these tasks to their children. It was a slippery slope and there was no recovery from that. In April of this year, the Labor Department issued a brief statement saying it was withdrawing the proposal. Quote, the Obama administration is firmly committed to promoting family farmers and respecting the rural way of life. To be clear, the statement continued, this regulation will not be pursued for the duration of the Obama administration. The Obama administration uh, rolled over and played dead on this rule. I've been in Washington for 36 years watching these issues. I have never seen such a definitive promise never to resurrect this rule for the duration of the Obama administration. The sad thing is it used to be that these kinds of rules were done by experts and did not become political footballs. Bill Field thinks that the Labor Department bungled the process from the start by not vetting the proposal with farmers and making it too far-reaching. We had an opportunity to address big ticket items that might save some lives and we threw it away it's going to be a long time before we see that kind of effort come again. There is no other grief as deep as the grief of a mother losing a child. It's a horrible place to be. It never goes away. After Tommy's death, Michigan safety regulators fined Pine Grove farm owners Dave and Don Schwab $3,500 and made them fix the augers, which, employees say, had been broken for three years. Mr. Schwab told regulators he was aware of the risks of working in a silo due to the toxic gases produced by fermenting corn, but said he had not heard of the engulfment hazard. He denied an interview request from the New York Times. You see some of my silo stuff I'm sending out to an FFA chapter in Middleton, Connecticut. Linda formed an organization in her son's memory, which works to educate about silo safety. But like other parents of children who have died on farms, she believes that education not regulation, is the key to protecting young workers. I don't want to see any more regulations on the farms. Tommy's accident was preventable. If the safety precautions would have been in place and education would have been there. But almost a year and a half after Tommy's death, his friend Gary is still bothered by a simple question. You can't blame Schwab for it, but on the other hand, you kind of kind of can, just if he'd have fixed it when it was broken. I've been to the silo now. Everything's fixed now. Why couldn't he have done that before? 